Galatians chapter 5, reading from verse 16. And God's word says, So I say, said the Apostle Paul, live by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. For the sinful nature <coughs> desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other, so that you do not do what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under law. The acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, uh, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, uh, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. This is God's word. When God's word is read, God himself speaks to you and I. Um, a man was walking through the supermarket, pushing a trolley, and in the trolley, along with these baked beans and his uh, cornflakes, was a screaming baby. And every few minutes, he would pause and lean forward, stroke the baby's head and say, keep calm, James, keep calm. And then he'd push on and he'd collect more things into his trolley. And the baby kept on screaming and he leaned forward and said, keep calm, James, keep calm. A, a, a lady, another customer in the shop, noticed this and uh, she, she walked up to him and said, sir, I must commend you for your patience with this baby. He turned to her and replied, thank you very much, madam. I am James. I am the one who needs to keep calm. We are studying the fruit of the Holy Spirit at, uh, for the last few weeks. The Holy Spirit is an expert at rubbing off our rough edges. Gradually, he has an intention in this, gradually to make us more and more like the Lord Jesus in character. So we're looking at two of the fruit of the Holy Spirit today, two sections of it. Remember, it's all one fruit with different segments like a tangerine. The two that we're looking at today are patience and goodness. Patience. Patience is such a rare thing nowadays. We all want to grow in patience, don't we? And when do we want it? Yeah. Now. <laughs> Thank you. So, I wonder if you've heard the words, I wonder if any of you grew up hearing the words from your parents, patience is a virtue, anybody? Yeah, yeah? It, it comes from a short poem, did you know that? It comes from a short poem that says, patience is a virtue, possess it if you can, seldom found in woman, never found in man. Is this true? So on a score of one to ten, what is your patience like? How patient are you on a score of 1 to 10? Maybe it's not you who should be giving your score out of 1 to 10, but, but those who you live with, those who, your nearest and dearest, perhaps, what would they say would be your score of 1 to 10? Would you be described as a patient person? Well, the Bible really really does talk much about patience. In 1 Corinthians 13, it says that love is patient. Love is patient. It's first in the list. It's first in the list for a reason. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It does not, it is not proud. It goes on to list a whole load of other things. But love is patient. Your demonstration of love Remember, it was Valentine's Day two days ago. Your demonstration of love is not in flowers and chocolates. Your demonstration of love, according to the Bible, is patience with those whom you love. So if you're, if you're a Christian, God wants you to be patient. God expects you to be patient. 
God, in his patience, understands that it's difficult, so has sent us the Holy Spirit to help us grow in this. If we are a child of God, then you need to be exhibiting the family resemblance, because God is patient with you. So you need to reflect the characteristics of your Heavenly Father. We all know people who are short-tempered. If you think of a pan, people who are short-tempered would be like a frying pan where the, where the oil is red hot and it's spitting and, uh, and spluttering around. Those kind of people who are short-tempered are not much fun to be around. The word that Paul uses in, in the original Greek, which I'm, I'm not clever enough to understand the Greek, but clever people tell me that the word that Paul used in the original Greek for patience was, you know, the opposite of being short-tempered? If there's such a word, it would be long-tempered. Okay, we all know what short-tempered is. The opposite, the word that Paul uses here is to be long-tempered with those whom you know and love. So instead of being a spitting frying pan, we want to be more of a, a slow cooker, one that's not going to over boil. This long temperedness is what you need when you're dealing with people, when you're dealing with people who provoke you, when so that you won't fly off the handle. You need to be long tempered when somebody hurts you and you choose not to retaliate. You need to be long-tempered when somebody is angry with you and you don't uh, respond in like. You need to show patience when you're going through difficult circumstances so that you don't give up, but you press on and press on to the end. So where do we see patience perfectly exhibited? Well, like all of the fruit of the Spirit, we see it perfectly exhibited in the life of the Lord Jesus. How patient he was with his disciples. <laughs> Out of all the people in the world at that time, he, he picked the right bunch, didn't he? After a night of prayer, he picked those twelve. Man, what a bunch they were. How Jesus needed such patience with them. When they, they, they just did such silly things time after time. In, in John 16, moments after Jesus had said, Who do people say I am? Some Elijah, some John the Baptist. What about you? Jesus and Peter, with a wonderful revelation from the Holy Spirit, says, You are the Christ. You are the Messiah. You are God's chosen one, the long-promised King. Jesus said, Excellent. It was God himself who revealed this to you. Now that you know that, in chapter 16, verse 21, Jesus went on to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, and he, that he must be killed, and on the third day raised to life again. What does Peter do? Took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, that should never happen to you. This kind of thing happened time after time. Jesus showed great, great patience when his disciples just didn't get it, when they failed to connect the dots that the Old Testament said that God's chosen King and Messiah must suffer and die. Even after Jesus had suffered and died, after the crucifixion, the resurrection, but before the ascension, in Acts chapter 1, it says that, the, the disciples gathered round him. This is minutes away before the ascension, right? After the crucifixion and resurrection, the disciples gathered around him and said, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Like, Lord, are you going to raise up an army and kick the Romans out? You can see Jesus kind of finding the nearest tree and going, boom, boom. Guys, you still don't get it. I have not come to be king of this world. My kingdom is in heaven. And that's where I'm off to. They still didn't get it. How the Lord Jesus needed such patience. A few examples of his, of his patience. As I say, he consistently told them that his kingdom was not of this earth, but of heaven. 
They still didn't get it. Jesus was constantly patient with his disciples. He was patient with those who came to him for the wrong reasons, like, like, like the rich young ruler. He was patient with the Pharisees who openly tried to trick him time after time. He was patient with Judas as he bent down and washed his feet, knowing that within an hour or two, Judas would get up, walk out and betray him. Jesus was patient when he was wrongfully arrested. He was patient when his friends deserted him. He was patient when he was put in front of that kangaroo court and accused, and yet, like a sheep before, his shearers are silent. He chose to say nothing. He was patient as the nails were driven into his hands and feet, remembering that he had the armies of heaven to call upon had he wanted to. He chose not to. He showed great patience as he was crucified. And he was, showed great patience as he prayed for the forgiveness of those who had done this deed to him. They all tried his patience, but the Lord Jesus is a man of immense patience. I believe this is a reading that we've already heard this morning from 1 Timothy chapter 1. It says, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst, said Paul. But for that very reason I was shown mercy, so that in me the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience. And as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. What, what, kind, of, what kind of patience has the Lord Jesus got? Immense. Praise God for the immense patience <coughs> of our risen Saviour. Paul says he's the, the chief of sinners, and even to a man like that, even to a man like this, even to men, women like you, the Lord Jesus shows immense patience. What about you? What's your patience like? What's your patience like with those who are slow to catch on? I'm thinking of the children who still don't use a knife and fork. What's your patience like when they don't catch on the way the disciples didn't? Are you patience, patient when people interrupt you? Perhaps phoning up from a call centre yet again. And again as we've seen, how patient are you behind the wheel of your car? How patient are you? The Lord expects us to be growing in patience. God is patient with you as you keep on doing those ridiculous, selfish, silly things day after day after day. Praise God that his patience doesn't run out. So he's, we know he's never going to get to the point of saying, I've had enough of them. They're just idiots. They'll never learn. I'll wash my hands of them. Praise God. He is patient with you and I. In <clears throat> second chapter, Second Peter chapter 3, uh, Peter writes, with the day, with, sorry, with the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promises, as some understand slowness. Instead, he's patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. The Lord our God is patient. He's patient in the way he rules over the universe, gradually and patiently working out his plans. He's patient with you, and this verse tells us he's patient with those who have not yet believed. So there's still an opportunity this is one of my favourite verses in the whole Bible. It says that there's still an opportunity for those who haven't yet bowed the knee before Jesus. But that patience is running out because one day the Lord Jesus is going to return and then it will be too late. Which brings a sense of urgency to our prayers and our witnessing, doesn't it? So how do we grow in patience? Because we all need to. By sticking as closely as possible to the Lord Jesus and keeping in step with the Holy Spirit. That way the fruit of the Spirit will grow. In Colossians chapter 3, 
It says, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion and kindness, humility, gentleness and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. These are things that we really need to take action upon. Forgive as the Lord forgave you and over all these virtues put on love which binds them all together in perfect unity. Because what is the first demonstration of love? Love is patient. So we need the Spirit's help. We have to do what we can to grow in patience. It's like putting on this spiritual clothing to exercise patience. The Holy Spirit is an expert in helping us. He wants to help us keep in step with the Spirit. Fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, and imitate him as he showed immense patience to you. One, one action that we need to do is to identify the trigger points. We need to identify what causes us to lose patience and be aware of them beforehand. And when that trigger point happens again, then we've already formulated a plan of how we're not going to react badly again. Yeah? We need to identify the trigger points and be aware of how we need to behave because patience is a choice patience is a choice we need to understand that we choose to be patient we choose not to be patient it's a choice so let us choose to exercise patience with those whom we live with let's choose to exercise patience with those those whom we work with to the same extent that Jesus has shown patience to you Pray for the Holy Spirit's help. How we need his help. And he's an expert in giving that help. He wants to give that help. He wants to help you grow in the likeness of the Lord Jesus Christ. So moving on to the, the second fruit in today's, the second segment in today's fruit. We're going to consider goodness. If you were to Ask some of your friends at work, who is good? What kind of people would they say? Well, they're likely to say people like Mother Teresa, Princess Diana, as she held that hand of the AIDS uh, sufferer. People like Nelson Mandela, Martin Luther King, Mahatma Gandhi. All these people the world would describe as good. What about the Bible? Who do you think the Bible lists as good? Do you think the Bible lists people like Abraham and David and Elijah and, and Isaiah as good? Well, according to the Bible, there's only one who is good. Only one who is good. The, in Mark chapter 10, the rich young ruler ran up to the Lord Jesus and he said, Good teacher. What must I do to inherit life? And Jesus said, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. And when he said this, Jesus was not saying that he is not good. He's saying that he is good and that he is God. Okay? He's, he's not saying that he's not good. He's saying that he is God. God alone is good. And only God is good, but once somebody starts to follow Jesus, then their goodness increases year in, year out, as the Holy Spirit delights us to make us more like the Lord Jesus. The dictionary, so we're talking about goodness, the dictionary would dis describe goodness as, as, being, as being morally good and virtuous. It would be some, somebody of integrity. Someone who opposes evil and sin. Romans chapter 12, verse 9 says, Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honour one another above yourselves. This is what the Bible expects from you if you're a Christian. If the Bible expects it, it's because God expects it. This is what God expects you 
to be doing this afternoon, tomorrow morning, tomorrow night, the rest of the week, the rest of your life. That's what God expects you to be doing. Your life should be characterized by Philippians 4, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable. If anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. I, I wish I had a pound for every time I've said, you need to print this out and stick it onto your television set. Really. You need to print that verse out and stick it on your television set. And that will help in the programs that you choose to watch. These passages tell us this tell us, tell us that those with a good heart will naturally do good things. There'll be people of integrity doing good things, choosing to do good things. Goodness will spill out. Uh, in the way that we live our lives, so that wherever we are, our presence makes the situation better. So, for example, at home, the fact that you are a Christian, you may be the only Christian there, the fact that you are a Christian should make a difference to your household. It should make a difference to the, to the atmosphere, to the conversation around the table, the fact that you're a Christian. Home should be a better place because you're there. Work should be a better place because you are there. You should be making a positive difference. School or university should be a better place because you are there making a difference as you choose to do good for those around you. Are you the only Christian in the queue at the post office when the queue is massive. You might not know if you're the only Christian in the, in the queue in the post office, but your presence should make that queue a better place in the way that you don't grumble about the weather, about the government, about the queue. Your presence should make a difference. John Wesley, we know about John Wesley, he was the founder of the Methodist Church, wasn't he? John Wesley said, do all the good you can, by all the means you can, in all the ways you can, in all the places you can, at all the times you can, to all the people you can, as long as ever you can. What a brilliant statement. What a brilliant statement. He's quite right. We, we should be doing that. Not to earn our salvation, that's a gift of, that's, that comes by faith alone. But because we are people of faith, then our actions should be doing all the good that we can in all the places, to all the people, for as long as ever we can. John Wesley did do all the good that he can. Taking exa his example from the Lord Jesus, him and his supporters that went and visited people in prison. Hmm. I drove up the A50 the other day. I passed three signs for prisons within the first 20 miles. Ha! Huh. John Wesley and his friends went visiting prisons. Alongside William Wilberforce, he, he fought the abolition of the slave trade. They visited the sick in hospitals and in the workhouses. They fed the poor. The sick were taught they helped those who were caught in the cycle of debt and they told the gospel to thousands and thousands of people. It seems that John Wesley was one who took notice of the Lord Jesus when at the end of the, the, the parable of the Good Samaritan, Jesus simply said, go and do likewise. Go and do likewise. You know, you know what the, the Good Samaritan did. You know the help that he gave. You know the good that he did. Go and do likewise, said Jesus. John Wesley did. These words of the Lord Jesus still apply to us today, don't they? Do good. Do good. Don't go and do likewise. So, do we take those words of the Lord Jesus? No. Out of sync. 
forgot to put that one in. Luke 10, verse 37, the Lord Jesus said, Go and do likewise, as the good Samaritan. So are we taking those words literally? Are we taking those words seriously? There are many examples, many opportunities for us to do good in this day and age. Some people here volunteer for Derby City Mission. That's a good thing to do. If you are doing that, keep on doing it. If you don't yet do it, Perhaps you consider that for next year and do good for those who are really in need of help within this city. Could you organise a food bank for work at work? Could you do that? Could you simply put a box out with a little sign saying food bank and tell people to bring in a couple of cans of beans or a bag of sugar once a week? That would be an incredibly easy thing to do. Check with your boss, but I think that would be an incredibly easy thing to do at work to put a, a box collecting for the food bank. How can you do good for the neighbours in your street, particularly the elderly? How can you make work a better place? S simple thing that in the olden days when I was a, a teacher, I know by the end of the day, there was a massive pile of dirty coffee cups just dropped in the sink. He, everybody ignoring the sign above the sink which said, please wash your own cup. Well, nobody did. They all just dumped in the sink. What a simple thing to roll your sleeves up and wash the mugs, particularly if nobody's watching. Yeah. How can you do good for those whom you work with? Imitate the Lord Jesus as he visited his friends in trouble. You know, we... Christians are kind of used to the phrase of visiting one another when we're sick or, or when we're in times of trouble or, or bereaved. People outside the church don't often do that. If you go and visit a friend who's not a Christian, perhaps a work colleague who's sick, if you go and visit them, they will be shocked. They will be thrilled. Really, because they don't expect it. It doesn't happen outside Christian circles. So be that person be that person and go and visit one of your work colleagues when you hear that they've, they've sent a, a sick note in. You don't expect it. You'll be so thrilled if you do go and visit somebody who's sick. Be like the Lord Jesus who befriended the outcasts. Show compassion to all that you meet. Feed the hungry. Jesus healed the sick. Well, you might find that one difficult. Okay, you might find healing the sick difficult. But visit them and pray for them is a good thing to do. And speaking of doing good, then the Lord Jesus died on the cross for your sins, didn't he? How much more good could he do for you? And as we've already seen, 1 John 3 says that he appeared so that he might take away our sins. And in him is no sin. In the Lord Jesus was only goodness. Imitate him. Imitate him. So we start coming to an end here. Do any of you know the name Corrie Ten Boom? Corrie Ten Boom? Any, any of you read the book, the, her book, The Hiding Place? Essential reading. Absolutely essential reading. The Hiding Place by Corrie Ten Boom. Corrie Ten Boom, she's got a funny name to us because she was Dutch. It, when she was a young Christian, during the days of the Second World War, Corrie, her sister Betsy, and her dad saved hundreds and hundreds of Jews who were being hounded down by the Nazis. They built in one of their rooms, her, her dad was a, a, a watchmender, and they had a, a, a tall, narrow, terraced house. Above the shop, in one of the bedrooms, they built a false wall uh, with a, a, a secret compartment. And you can see that's how somebody's getting into that secret part, compartment. The house is now a museum and the, 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 the hiding place has been opened up. But that's where hundreds and hundreds of Jews were hidden over the years of the Second World War. Eventually, Somebody reported them to the Nazis 
and Corrie and her sister and dad were sent off to a concentration camp in Germany. Dad died 10 days later and Corrie wrote about God in her book, The Hiding Place. She said, often I've heard people say, how good God is, we prayed for sunshine on our church picnic and the sun is shining, how good is our God? Yes, God is good when he sends good weather. But God was also good in the concentration camp when I watched my sister Betsy die of starvation. God was still good. Corrie did good to the Jews who were in fear of their lives from the Third Reich. Regardless of the dangers and the sacrifice for herself and for her family, she did good to those who desperately needed it. So as the Lord Jesus did good for you by sacrificially giving himself, then can I encourage you not to do easy stuff like washing coffee cups, despite the fact that I, I encourage you to do that. Sacrificially do good for other people. Be a Christian who is so filled with the goodness of the Holy Spirit that you will give, give yourself for the good of other people. Be like the Lord Jesus who laid down his life so that you could be free. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Keep in step with the Holy Spirit. Ask him to make you more and more like the Lord Jesus as the fruit of the Spirit grows in you. As you show patience even today. As you choose to do goodness at work tomorrow morning and with your friends and family tomorrow night. And for the rest of the week, and for the rest of our lives. What a powerful witness that is. It brings such glory to the Lord Jesus, the way we live our lives. It's all for his glory. Keep in step with the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit to the glory of Jesus. Amen.